Let's turn to James chapter 1. James is talking about the trying or the testing of our faith. The purpose of God testing you is not to destroy you. Nor is it that God might know the truth. God does know the truth about you. He knows the truth about you better than you know yourself. David said, search me, O God. Know my heart. But you see, at the beginning of that psalm, he said that, Lord, you know me. You know my down-sittings, my uprisings. You know my thoughts in their origins. Such knowledge is too great for me. I cannot attain it. The man who really understands that he doesn't know himself is the man who does ask the Lord to search him. Put me through the test. Reveal, Lord, what you know about me. Peter didn't know the truth about himself. Peter thought that he could stand up under the most severe pressure. Jesus knew better. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Peter denied vehemently, ever denying the Lord. Lord, I'd die for you. But Jesus knew. And thus Peter was put through the test, not for Jesus to find out, but for Peter to find out. The purpose of testing is not to destroy, but is to prove, prove the merit, to prove the value. In our space program, the shuttle has been made of all kinds of exotic materials. The tiles that were used on the nose cone were subjected to many rigorous tests. They were heated up thousands of degrees to see if they could withstand the friction heat as the uh, space shuttle re-entered our atmosphere. They were frozen. They were subjected to all kinds of pressure. Not that they were wanting to break the tiles. They were concerned that the tiles would not fail when it came to the actual re-entry into the atmosphere of the earth. For we did not want to jeopardize the lives of the astronauts by tiles that could not stand up under the heat and under the pressure. They realized that it was a matter of life or death for the astronauts. And thus, it was important that these tiles be tested to make sure that under the actual pressures and heat of the reentry, they would function as they were designed to function to take the heat and to uh, keep the uh, space shuttle from burning up. Now, we're talking about a matter of eternal life and eternal death. Thus, how much more do we want to make certain that our faith that we profess is genuine and will gain us entry into the kingdom of God? And so the Lord puts our faith to a test. Oftentimes, our faith is put to extreme test. 
to determine whether or not the faith is actually genuine, to show us where our heart really is. You see, Jesus said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Now, I want to make certain that I'm on that straight and narrow path. Thus, when God puts me through the test, to show what's in my heart. I rejoice that I have been tested. The faith has proved to be genuine. I know that I'm on the straight and the narrow path because broad is the path and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many on that path. In Ecclesiastes, it says there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I was talking with a young man who years ago was in a Sunday school class and with a group of young people that I was teaching. And he said, Chuck, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm a Mormon now. Now I'm certain that his conversion to the Mormon religion was relatively new. He didn't realize that they consider and think of themselves as Christians. But I also knew that one of the weaknesses of the Mormon belief is that they believe that you can't know for certain whether or not you're saved until you die. And so I, I asked him if he was still saved, and he said, nobody knows that until, you're, until you die. I said, don't you think that's a little late to find out? I mean, I wouldn't want to go through life with that kind of uncertainty. Well, I hope I'm on the right path. Well, I hope that I'm believing the right things. Well, I hope that I have sufficient faith. I want to know. Eternity is too important to, to leave with sort of a hope so. Think so. Maybe so kind of a relationship. I don't want that. I want to know so. I want to know. And thus the Lord puts me through test to prove the merit, the value of the faith. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, said, Know ye not that unright the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. There are many people who are deceived on the issue of entry into the kingdom of heaven. They think that entry is a much simpler thing. I believe that it is possible that people are deceived concerning their eternal destiny. that a person oftentimes believes that when he dies, he's going to go to heaven, but he will actually end up in hell. I'm certain from the scriptures and from actual experience of meeting and talking with people that there are multitudes of people in hell tonight who actually thought they were going to heaven. They were trusting in their infant baptism to save them. Or they were trusting in their attendance at the church to save them. With this young Mormon boy, I said, on what are you basing now your hope for eternal life? He said, my faith in Jesus Christ and continued membership in the Mormon church. 
I said, well, had you just stopped when you said my faith in Jesus Christ, I would concur with you. But when you add the, the rest of it, uh, that gives me a problem. There are people who are in hell who were trusting in their good works, in their Americanism. But they were never born again by the Spirit of God, which Jesus declared was a prerequisite for entry into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, you must be born again. You've got to have a spiritual birth. You were born once of the flesh. But now you have to be born of the spirit. And there's got to be a spiritual birth. So the Lord puts us through test. In order that the trial of our faith, the testing becomes more precious than gold because it proves the worth, the value, the genuineness of my professed faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want to be deceived concerning my eternal destiny. The Bible tells us to make our calling and election sure. So James tells us that the testing or the proving of our faith worketh patience. It is interesting how many times patience is associated with persecution or with trials or with tribulation. In Romans 5, 3, Paul said, And not only so, but we gr glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In his second letter to the Corinthians 6, 4, Paul said, But in all things, proving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities and in distresses. Second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And James again in chapter 5, verse 10 said, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. So patience, this patience related to affliction, persecution, tribulation, that patient waiting upon God and committing myself to God, though I don't know the outcome of the situation. Just that commitment to God. Lord, it's in your hands. I'm waiting upon you. And I'm resting in you. Not fretting not getting all upset and trying to work things out myself. Lord, it's in your hands. And that patient waiting upon God to accomplish in this particular testing his purposes in my life. So James said, let patience then have her perfect work. The word translated perfect, of course, you know, means of full age or mature or complete. 
Let patience have her complete work. Now, what is the complete work of patience in our life? Again, in Romans 5, 3, 4, and 5, he said, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. So actually, the patience is bringing us to hope. From experience to hope. Now, for some reason, when psychologists seek to understand human behavior, they oftentimes use rats for their experience, experiments. And so in your psychology book, you will read all of these tests that were done on rats as they're trying to understand why we behave as we do. I really don't know what the connection is, uh, except that I've met a few. Uh, <laughs> but on the subject of hope, they took some Norwegian wharf rats and they put them in these tubs and they kept a sprinkler going in the tub so that they couldn't roll over and float. Otherwise the water would get up their nostrils, but just letting them swim in these tubs. And they found that on an average, the wharf rats would drown in a, about a, an hour's time. Then in a control group, the same experience, experiment, but with a control group, group, just about the time that they were drowning, they took them out of the tub and they dried them off and, and just put them back in their cages for a while. And then they put them back in the tubs again. And they discovered that now, the second time in the tub, it took them 37 hours before they drowned. And they, in the experiment, said the rats had an experience of salvation. They had been saved from drowning once, and thus they had this hope because of their experience that they would be saved again. Thus, the hope kept them going so much longer because they're, the experience of once being saved, that hope that they're going to pick me out again, you know, and just keep going a little longer. And, and so they kept going on the basis of the experience, the hope they had as a result of their experience of being saved. Well, Paul says that this patience works experience. As I wait on God, I have experienced the help of God, the strength of God, the working of God. I've seen God work it out. And thus, as I get into a, another difficult area of persecution or tribulation or testing, I have that hope as a result of my experiences of God's faithfulness 
that God is going to work this out also. So the patience brings me the experience of God's working, which brings to me the hope that in the future time, as I am facing difficulties, I, my hope is in the Lord. He's going to take care of it. Let patience have her complete work, which will bring you to that hope. It is a hope that we will have eternal life with our Lord. And I'm sustained by that hope. And I can endure the inequities that I see in this world because I am hoping for a better world. I can put up with a lot of things that I see that are wrong because I realize this world is not my home. I'm hoping for a much better place. The Jehovah Witnesses taught that Christ established his kingdom on the earth in 1917. And that he is actually reigning now from secret chambers. And in talking with the Jehovah Witness, I said, you know, I had hoped for something better than this. <laughs> if we're in the kingdom age now, that's sort of tragic. I was hoping it would be better. I do hope. for that kingdom age and for that coming kingdom of God. Paul speaks of the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Later on in this letter, chapter 5, James will exhort us to patience as we wait for the Lord's coming. The hope is the coming of the Lord, the establishing of his kingdom. And he said, have patience, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. You know, I have discovered that I can endure almost anything if I know that it's not going to last very long. It's only when you think, this is forever. I'll never be able to walk again. I'll never feel good again that you begin to get discouraged. If you realize, oh, this is going to pass. This is only for a little while. My, my dentist has fits because I won't take Novocaine. And when they grind down the teeth to put the caps on, I just say, go ahead, grind away. I know it's not going to last long. <laughs> and so you can handle anything if you know it's not going to last long. My wife said I'm afraid of the pain of the needle. <laughs> but I just in my mind say, well, it's only going to hurt for a little while. And, and I, I just, you know, can handle it as long as I know this isn't forever. That old song they used to sing, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. And, and so if you know that this is going to pass, this is just for a time, but there's something better that's coming, then we can put up with it. We can endure it. People endure painful operations and 
the painful time of recovery because they know that when they've recovered from that operation, they're going to be so much better. So I know that it's only a matter of time until my body goes ahead and, and, and repairs itself and I'll be feeling good again. And thus, you, you're willing to put up with the pain and the inconvenience and the time of recovery from surgery or an operation because you know that when it's all over, you're going to be so much better. Now, the question is, can I trust the Lord and wait for him to do his work and to bring his will to pass in my life? Can I endure this knowing that God is through this going to work out his purposes? Through this, he's teaching me patience. Through this, I'm experiencing the faithfulness of God. And he's bringing me to that wonderful hope of the future. I know that when I pass through this, it is is like Job said, I know that when I am tried, I'm going to come forth like gold. Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. The hope of the future, the hope of what this is going to produce in me. The relationship with the Lord that's going to be enhanced as the result of my trusting in him and resting in him and the joy of seeing God work and seeing God work out the situation. So, many times I need to be reminded that God is in control. When I forget that, I panic. When I think that I've got to do something, that can get scary. But when the Spirit reminds me that God is in control, He is in control over my life, over the circumstances of my life, He knows everything I am going through. He's in control of all these things. And all of these things are working together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. I need to learn what Nebuchadnezzar learned through his madness that the Most High reigns and rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. I have to remember that. God reigns over the kingdoms of men. I have to remember that so often under President Clinton. <laughs> I don't agree with so many of his policies. And, and when I see the direction that the nation is going under his leadership, and oh, I, I have to just remember that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. And when Nebuchadnezzar recovered from his madness, He said, I praise and honor him who lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all of the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say unto him, what are you doing? 
God's in control. I need to be reminded of that. I find that as I look at the conditions of the world today, I see the reducing of our military strength while Russia continues to increase her military strength. I see us disarming while Russia is arming. I see the weakened position that we are being placed in from a military standpoint, and I understand that the, the whole reason behind it is that we will be more or less coerced and forced into the global community. And when I start to see that, there's enough red blood in me still <laughs> as an American and growing up being taught that we were the greatest nation in the world and I was proud to be an American and we have the liberties and the freedom. All, and you know, when I see the erosion of our liberties and freedoms, it used to be that I would get just so upset Frustrated, too, because you don't know what to do. But then, when I read in the scriptures that this has to come to pass, that there will be a global government, the global community is going to be a reality. It's all a part of the prophecies. I think, even so, put it together, boys. Because <laughs> I'm going to be out of here. You know, the, 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 the Lord is coming. And, and I'll tell you what, that's helped me tremendously. Help the frustrations and all that I that I feel when I see things moving the directions they are, it helps tremendously to realize the Lord has told us that these things are going to transpire in the last days. And during the days of the ten kings shall the Lord of heaven come and establish a kingdom that shall never end. And as we see the the 10 economic communities being formed as part of this whole global community, the global economics and all. I realize that these things were all predicted. They're coming to pass and praise God. The rest of it's going to come to pass too. And our Lord is coming soon. So as David said in the 37th Psalm, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Now that, that's, that's pretty heavy and that's pretty good because we're used to to fretting over these things. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, and fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, patience, waiting, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, you will diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves 
in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes upon him with his teeth, but the Lord shall laugh at him, for he sees that his day is coming. Now, we need to just see, well, yeah, you may be doing, but your day is coming, man. And, and thus, waiting patiently, resting in the Lord, not worrying, not fretting ourselves, not getting angry, forsaking wrath, but just know that the day of the Lord is coming and that hope that we have. So the patience, let it have its perfect work. What is the complete work of, when I really have come to this patience, then I have this hope. I'm just going to wait patiently upon the Lord because I know that God is at work and will work. So James said, let patience have her complete work that you may be complete and entire, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. So the perfect work of patience, you become complete. You become entire. And you lack nothing. It is so important that we grow up in our Christian walk. That we become mature. Perfect is mature, full age or mature. And that maturity, that Christian maturity. Paul speaks of the purpose of the church. The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. The edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto that fully mature man, perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children who are tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine and sight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So, that you might become fully mature, complete in your walk in the Lord. Book of Hebrews said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into maturity, into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Let's go on. Let's mature. Let's grow up. Patience brings us that maturity, that growing up. That we might lack nothing. Now, in the next verse he said, if you lack wisdom, then you should ask God. Now, there are a lot of prayers that go up and bring nothing down. What's wrong when our prayers seem to bring nothing down? We'll look at that next week in our next lesson. If you lack, you're to ask of God, but then... Sometimes we ask and we don't get the answers. Why? And James will deal with that in our lesson next week. Father, we pray that we might become mature. Complete. Lacking nothing. And so, Lord, put us through those tests that we might learn to wait on you, that we might develop, Lord, this kind of quiet, 
waiting in the hope of your work. Thank you, Lord, for the experiences that we've had of your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you've always come through. You've not failed. And Lord, we look forward to your continued work of developing in us that waiting upon God patiently for him to accomplish his work and his purposes that we might grow up, mature, be complete, and lack in nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.